Okay, so we've invited Stephanie, and she's a well-known researcher who's been working at Fraunhofer for a number of years. I can't eight remember years. Eight years. Um, and she is part of our advisory board, and so we've invited her to, to join the meeting and to get to know the, the project, but also so that we can learn from, from her about uh, her work at Fraunhofer. Thank you, Simon. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Estefania, and the title of my talk is Application-Oriented Research, What is it, Who does it, and why? And what I want to present today is a very general overview of how um, applied research fits into the research ecosystem, particularly in the European context. But I'm going to start <laughs> with a very brief introduction uh, of myself. So I'm originally from Colombia, from Medellin in Colombia. Uh, and in Colombia, I studied, did my bachelor degree in electronic engineering and music. So I spent the early years of my uh, professional career doing electronics and circuit design. But very soon I moved to the United States to do my masters. And that's when I first got uh, involved in music information retrieval. Uh, so this is one, uh, what I want to uh, portray here. So I was doing engineering music and I got involved with science. Uh, and while I was doing my masters, I wrote my thesis on lead and accompaniment separation for music education applications, right? And that's basically what brought me into my PhD program in, in Germany. I did my PhD with Fraunhofer uh, IBMT, where I kept walking, working on the, pro on the topic of uh, lead and accompaniment separation. Um, I did my PhD in Fraunhofer, and then after my PhD, I worked there for about four years. And about a year ago, I moved to Singapore for a research stay. I'm currently in Singapore, working in a joint appointment with Singapore and Germany. Um, and basically what I'm doing at the moment in Singapore is working a little bit more with uh, empirical studies. They have a very strong emphasis there uh, with empirical uh, work. So I'm learning a little bit of this topic while being in Singapore. But what I want to, to, to show here is that my whole research experience after my, during my PhD and after my PhD has always been with applied research. Both Fraunhofer and ASTAR are applied research institutions. So more or less what I'm going to tell you today is my experience working in these two institutions. But I also want to very briefly um, talk about what my research topics are. So as I mentioned already, I did my PhD in sound separation, the topic of lead and accompaniment separation, very much targeting music education applications uh, where you would be willing to create backing tracks to, pa uh, to practice with. Um, that's what leads to the second topic, a strong emphasis in music education. And more recently, mostly in my postdoc years, I started working in computational musical, uh, musicology and digital ar archives, basically applying MIR techniques in these two fields. Okay, so I'm going to start by giving a very general definition of what the difference is between basic research and applied research, which is the same as application-oriented research. And I'm very sure that you've heard this before many times, but I want to uh, just repeat it one more, more time, just to emphasize a couple of things. So the difference between basic research and applied research is that basic research is curiosity driven, right? So the goal is to simply, not simply, but to answer questions to gain and expand knowledge, right? And there's never uh, immediate commercial, commercial objective with basic research, yeah? So you're just trying to understand fundamental principles without any further agenda, let's say it that much. In contrast, applied research has a very specific, um, it's attempting to answer very specific questions to solve very practical problems, right? So we want to develop technologies, products, products or processes, but they're very specific to a very practical problem, right? So the MIR community in a way is very close to applied research because very often, not everyone, but very often we are focusing on developing technologies, right? For different applications, but it's technology driven in many cases. But the point that I want to highlight here is that these things are not completely independent. 
yes, you cannot say that you can do just basic research or you cannot say that you can just do applied research because applied research builds upon everything that basic research has created. So all the fundamental principles and explanations that uh, basic research come up, comes up with are the things that we take in applied research to build our technologies, to build our products, to build our processes, right? So this is what I'm, I have here down uh, with the arrows. A basic research leads to new technologies, enables the development of new technologies. But there's another connection that goes the other way around, which basically, once we have new technologies, once people are faced with new use cases, new environments, this leads to new fundamental questions that it's the uh, job of basic research to try to answer, right? But is this relationship between these two things that I want to highlight, these things have to coexist. They are not independent of each other, right? And what I have here is just a very short list of a few of the research institutions that focus on applied research. The list is very, very large. I just picked a few of them. Um, for example, the Fraunhofer Society in Germany, who is the largest applied research in Europe. A star in Singapore, which is the Agency for Science, Technology and Research, which is also a applied research. A, the National Institute of, of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology in Japan. And those, for you, those of you that, for example, know uh, Masataka Goto, his lab uh, is based in uh, AIST in Japan. And another example is, for example, the National Applied Research uh, Laboratories in Taiwan. So these are all uh, research, applied research institutions, but there are many in the United States. In Latin America, they're starting to appear more and more, and there are many more uh, European ones that I don't have listed here. But okay, so you might be asking yourselves, but why? Why do we have to care about applied research and why is this important? So I'm going to try to explain where this is coming from. So if you see here, the, the, the reference for this thing, for this uh, quote, is quite old, it's from 1995. And this comes from a paper uh, published by the European Commission, which was called Green Paper on Innovation, where they coined that term that was the European paradox. They conducted certain studies back then, and they realized that the conclusion of these studies were, was that um, European countries have a, had a very strong science base, very strong scientific output, but very weak innovation performance and exploitation, right? So what they were saying is like, the, one of the best, some of the best research institutions in the world are European. The research output is high quality and very strong, but the European countries are not the ones who are exploiting these research outcomes, right? So that's what they, they, they call the European paradox. Strong science, but weak exploitation. So since then, and if you realize this is quite old, but since then there is more and more efforts, there are more and more efforts from the European Commission to try to strengthen European institutions to exploit the research outcomes that they are producing. And they, among the many uh, different things that they have published and the programs that they have developed, this one is a little bit uh, more recent from 2013. They published a paper say, called Innovation, how to convert research into commercial success stories. And what they came up with uh, in this publication is what they call the innovation pathway, right? So um, this diagram here should be understood not like a sequential thing from one to eight, but more of a parallel thing. So they propose that these eight things should happen simultaneously, research, interaction with users, exploring markets, IP management, uh, industrial demonstrations, product trials, industrialization and innovation management. And they propose that these things should always feed information to each other, give feedback, um, try to work together in a process to, uh, in the attempt to make research outcomes better for exploitation after the research project has finished. So I'm sure your supervisors um, can witness to, to that, that every day more and more the European uh, Union 
calls for projects that try to bridge this link between industry and academia, and it's basically what is happened here. But it's coming from all this research in the past where they realized that the exploitation of research outcomes was not happening inside the European countries. All right. So this is the motivation, let's say, of why, are we, why we need to worry about uh, bridging this gap between industry and uh, academia. But I also want to explain to you a little bit how the process works. And excuse me for the oversimplification of the process, but for understanding purposes, I took a very simple depiction of how uh, applied research works. I later will give you a bit more detail about it. So in the simplest case, there's industry and there's a problem that they, with their own technologies, their own knowledge, their own research, uh, their own stuff, they cannot solve, right? So they need a solution to the problem. So that's where the research community comes in, right? And here again, I want to highlight the importance between the, the communication between basic research institutions and applied research institutions. So the researchers put their heads together and we come up with a solution, right? So there's a solution to the industry pro problem that uh, was blocking uh, development. So the economy grows. The governments are happy and the funding ke keeps coming, right? So it's a cycle. This is of course an oversimplification of the process but what the European Commission and the European countries want is that the research that is happening is closer to industry so that this growth happens and the funding can keep coming, right? I know as a rich researcher that commercial exploitation sometimes feels very uncomfortable, right? Because sometimes you just don't want to do research for the sake of doing research, right? You don't want to think about how much money your research could make in the future. So what I think about when I feel like the days that I wake up feeling uncomfortable with commercial exploitation is this is a way, an attempt to make research more sustainable in a world where basically is ruled by uh, finances. So if the money is not there, then research funding will not come, right? So this is a, an attempt to make the ecosystem a little bit more sustainable and that we can keep doing research that supports the economy of the countries. So that's a very general oversimplification of the problem, but I'm going to give you a little bit more detail of how this is done in Fraunhofer. And again, I want to make, um, let's say, a, a note here that this is specific to Fraunhofer. Other institutions might handle things different, might have different models, but I'm going to describe what happens inside Fraunhofer. Right. So these are numbers from 2017, so the current ones might be a bit different, but Fraunhofer has a yearly a annual research budget of 2.6 billion euros, right? This money is, um, goes to a total of 26, about 26,000 staff members, mm -hmm. but this happens in 72 research institutions, right? So Fraunhofer, is, um, Fraunhofer institutes are located all over Germany, and each Fraunhofer institute has a very specific topic that they research and that they develop. So there are uh, research institutions for material sciences, defense research, wireless communication, digital media technology, right? But what's mo most important in, is what I, I'm showing here in the, on, the, uh, on the graph. So from 100% of the research budget that Fraunhofer has every year, there's this 30%, the top 30% that comes from the government, right? So the German government tells Fraunhofer, here is this money, use it for research. But this is about 30% of uh, the budget that Fraunhofer has. And this happens the same, is the same thing that happens with university. The German government gives X amount of money for them to conduct the, their research and education efforts. For Fraunhofer, it's about 30% of the annual budget. The remaining 70% of the budget that Fraunhofer needs to run their yearly research um, activities has to be acquired either from industry of, or public finance, and by public finance I mean 
a research grants from the European Union, from the German government. So it's a mix between working with industry and securing public finance. So when people ask me what the main difference that at least very personally I feel uh, is between working in a university and working in Fraunhofer is basically this, that this uh, requirement for constantly securing financing is very present when you work in Fraunhofer. You need to make sure that this 70% is achieved so that you can continue your annual um, research and you reach your budget every year. So that's very clear in Fraunhofer. The other thing that happens and now that I've been in, in Singapore, I realize that it's also happened in ASTAR. It's not only a Fraunhofer. There's a constant struggle or a constant uh, push and pull between the government and the institutions on how much, how far this uh, funding goes. So of course the government wants to make it smaller. The institutions want it to be bigger because it means that they have to acquire less uh, industrial contracts, but there's always a push and pull here. So when you work in Fraunhofer, then you, you, you know you have to secure this 70% uh, budget for research. And Fraunhofer has uh, developed cooperation models in which we can acquire this uh, budget. So the simplest one is the one-off contracts, which is basically the depiction that I showed you in the beginning. There's an in, uh, industry partner that has a problem, and the industry partner hires Fraunhofer so that they solve the problem for them. This is one, one contract for a very specific solution. That's an easy one. There are a more complex one, for example, large scale projects where more complex problems with multiple part partners are addressed. For example, other Fraunhofer institutes, also the industry or other universities. An example of this one would be, for example, European projects. In European projects you usually have a, a very diverse mix of partners but this still falls into the 70% for Fraunhofer. Strategic partnerships, this happens if, when it's pre-competitive research, which starts without any contract. And it's, for example, let's say an audio technology a company decides or realized that the future of audio technology is augmented uh, auditory realities, let's say that. But with the technologies that we don't, that we have at the moment, we want, we, we are not capable of developing commercially viable products for augmented reality. So what they do is they partner up with Fraunhofer to, de to, do, to perform this pre-competitive research. So they both put money or an effort into developing the, the products, developing the technologies, and where, when they are ready for exploitation, they both profit from this exploitation. But this happens be before technologies are ready to be exploited. That's why it's called pre-competitive. There's also the possibility to create innovation clusters, which these are long-term collaborations between multiple research institutions and companies, but this is within a same region. So let's say, for example, in a certain region of uh, Germany, there's a very strong uh, carbon mining, let's say something. So they put the, the companies, the, inst the research institutions, the universities that are working on mining, and they create innovation clusters so that they can build the, the field together. And finally, the easiest one, and the one that it's, let's say, more, most familiar to all of us is spin-offs, where basically most of the time Fraunhofer employees become independent with a certain technology, a certain development, and they try to bring it to, to the market. Within the Fraunhofer Society, there are mainly two institutes that work in music research, which is Fraunhofer IDMT, which is located in Ilmenau, uh, which is the institute where I work. And there's also the Fraunhofer IIS, which is located in Erlangen. And even though they focus a lot on audio research, they also do a lot of music research. Okay. So now that I've given like a general overview of applied research and how it, how it more or less worked in Fraunhofer, I thought it would be a good idea to just show you some examples of research collaborations that uh, us at Fraunhofer IDMP have performed that are very directed to music research and in very much contact with industry. So I'm going to just give you a few examples. Um, 
So we have a school, it's an app developed by a company called LearnField. It's a very small German startup, but they have been very successful in securing money, uh, financing. And what they want to develop is music education, a music education app, particularly targeting piano, uh, lear learning to play the piano. So they have developed a very well thought curriculum that you can use to build your skills slowly to play the piano. Um, and they came to Fraunhofer IDM team searching for technologies for polyphonic pitch, detect pitch detection. So they needed to be able to capture the performance of the piano students in order to give them some ratings, some feedback. So they came to us and this was one of the, if you remember the cooperation models, it was a one-off contract. So they said, we need technologies of this kind. Can we build this together? And uh, this happened. So if you want to check uh, the app, you can go online. But uh, I'm going to show you a short video of the, um, of the app itself. Let's hope this works. Learning piano with Scoob is easy. Scoob helps you learn popular songs, the theory behind them, and even shows you proper playing technique all blended together in a fun, interactive set of over 200 lessons. What's more, Scoob listens to your performance and gives you feedback on your progress. Delight your friends and family when you play the melodies you wrote yourself. Learn how with Scoob. Start now. Go to scoob.com or download the app. So these are the things that we sometimes as researchers don't think. You will never think of putting someone dancing before, I mean, to advertise your research, but I mean, this is what happens. And they've been quite successful in securing funding and they've, they've built their technology slowly, slowly, but continuously. So, and as I'd say, it's a small startup in Germany and they're located in Berlin at the moment, but they seem to be doing quite well. So this was SCOOF, and as I said, that was a polyphonic transcription technologies, a polyphonic pitch detection, sorry. Um, another such a, collaboration is with a company called Jamahook, which is a slar slightly larger company in Switzerland. Um, also extremely successful in securing funding. Um, and what they advertise, the, their, it's a platform, they advertised uh, Jamahook as a social platform for musicians, artists, beat makers, music produ producers, and you. And when Jamahook came to us, um, they were mainly looking for technologies for music similarity. So they wanted to be able to take a given loop, music sample, and be able to find in a database music samples that were harmonically related, a, a rhythm similarity, melodic similarity, timbre similarity. So we've been working with Jamahook for some time now. You can also check the the website online, they already have the platform, it's already live, it's in beta testing, but you can already go to the platform and try the different similarity options that they have. But I also thought that it would be better for me to show a video. They have some tutorial videos online, so the one that I'm going to show you is just one of those tutorial videos. Hi, this is Kareem from JAMO, the Sound Playground. And in this video, I wanna show you how you can enhance your ongoing music productions or how you can find inspiration for the beats that you're doing. I actually took one of my own incomplete songs where I was searching for the missing piece of the puzzle and I uploaded it on Jamma Hook and I found the perfect matching loop to complete the hook line. Let's get straight to it. So here I am on the Jamma Hook profile and I'm gonna upload the Never Let Go Now tune. Extracting the details, we got a classification tool and it actually analyzes your beat or the sound that you're uploading. Um, this one gave me 133 BPM automatically. It's actually in 132. And I'm gonna adjust it a little bit. Sometimes you get perfect results and sometimes you just gotta adjust a couple of things. So just gonna fill this out and get straight to the tune. Quickly check it. And I'm going to go to find a match. Now, I'm going to go straight to harmony matching because I want to find a harmony matching sound to this beat. And this is what I found. Beautiful sounding synth. 
So I'm going to add that to the jam play and time stretch it to 132, which is the BPM of my reference track. Convert it. And here we go. Thanks for watching and stay hooked. So that was Jamma Hook. Now I'm going to move to something completely di different, which is a company called Telecontrol, which is also located in Switzerland. And um, Telecontrol uh, focuses on um, audio matching, audio fingerprinting for audience measurement which is something very uh, related to what um, PMAT is going to tell us about later on, right? But um, Telecontrol and Fraunhofer IDMT have been working together for a very long time, for a long time, um, about around 2010, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we started working together. And one of the first things that uh, we developed together was a audio matching uh, technology, audio fingerprinting technology which basically what they want to do is f a measure audience in broadcast material. So basically they want to, to know who is watching what in TV and radio programs. So initially they would use um, systems like this one, like small device that they would place in people's homes. That's why it's called panel household. Um, this, this, um, this device would send information to um, to a data retrieval uh, unit um, of the uh, broadcast material that uh, each household was listening to. And there, was also the, there is also the input from the site satellites, the TV, all the TV channels, the studio samples that go into a matching server. So basically what happens here is that we match what's coming from the satellites with respect to what people are watching at home, right? So we try to find out from this content that is being broadcast what are people listening at home, right? Which programs, which radio and TV channels people are listening or, or watching at home? And then we produce an usage data, right? So who is watching and who is watching what and when, right? Um, when I started collaborating, this, this, as I said, has been happening for a long time. I have not been involved in all the time in this collaboration, but I was very heavily involved in a project that lasted around three years and was the development of the same matching technology, but that would not require placing these devices in people's homes, and that would run in a portable device like a watch. This is not the watch, but something like a watch or uh, any portable device. So um, it was the challenge of creating a fingerprinting technology that would be robust to noise, right? Because when you have the broadcast material coming directly into the device, you don't have a background noise you know that you get clean signals to perform the fingerprinting on, extract the fingerprints from. But when a mobile device is capturing the audio streams from the environment, you have to deal with noise, you have to deal with the fact that when you're watching TV, very often people are talking or someone is cooking in the kitchen, so there's always noise around you. So it was the challenge of developing that uh, uh, noise robust fingerprinting, fingerprints, and actually the um, the challenge of being computationally efficient enough so that it could be run in one of these devices. So as I said, technologies for audio fingerprinting. And this is something that um, I never consider my own research topic. I never worked in this project, in this topic before I started collaborating with telecontrol. But this is something that happens when you work in applied research institutions. You have to be a little bit flexible to direct your research to where the projects are coming from. And this is what happened with telecontrol. 
Um, I'm just going to list here very quickly other research collaborations that Fraunhofer has uh, had in the past. For example, with Brose, Brown, Grace Note, um, coming from broadcast industry, digital archives, manufacturing industry, other research institutions, music produc production, and content providers. Okay, so I'm going to finalize this talk by talking a little bit about the Sanctuary project. The Song Susi project was the project, it was an European project that financed my research, my PhD research um, and was conducted at Fraunhofer IDMT. And the reason why I want to focus on this project is because Song Susi shows the whole process of applied research, um, uh, applied research process, which is basically start with a, a project proposal, funding com coming from the European Commission, all the way into taking songs to see to a commercial uh, application. So the songs to see project, I think I was not in Fraunhofer when they pro when they uh, sent this uh, project yet when they uh, wrote this proposal. But the the original project proposal, the idea from songs to see was music visualization through an interactive application based on technologies for automatic music transcription. And this was, I think, maybe 2009, 2010. But if you read this, it sounds quite rudimentary, right? It doesn't sound very exciting. But this was back when we were still dealing with trying to do pitch extraction, monophonic pitch extraction. And I mean, MIR was not at the point that we are now. So this was like groundbreaking research back then. So as I said, it was uh, partially funded by the European Union and also um, the German government uh, in particular. And again here, it was this emphasis on working with industry and academia together. So the first three first partners from this project are companies, two German companies, which are Kids Interactive and Kids for Brains. Then there was Greek Music Education, which is a, a company located in Norway. Then there was Tampere, Tampere University in Finland and Fraunhofer IDMT, who was a, leading the project. So I'm just going to show you a few of the um, images of the development process of Songs to See. So this was the initial idea in 2010 of the interface that uh, we wanted to develop. So I don't know if you can read because the handwriting is not very clear, but this is supposed to be a score sheet. These are supposed to be the sliders where you control the interface, some fingering animations here. And here was supposed to have a piano roll where you can see what you're playing. Uh, when you perform your instrument. Then a few months later, it, was, it looked a little bit better. So we already had a very broad, rudimentary piano roll. These were all fakes. So we just have a, a picture of the trumpet. We had images for scores, but you could, let's say, score, scroll up and down, but the, there was no score rendering yet. It was just images played there. Then it became a little bit better. So we already had real-time pitch detection that was working here. We still had fake fingerings and fake scrolls, um, scores. What I mean fake is the, the, these images there. Um, but this was a project that was uh, already presented in CMMR in 2010. Don't recall exactly who presented it, but it was already, let's say, showing the first uh, research publications. Then later on in March 2011, so we had a little bit better looking uh, a piano roll representation when, I don't know if you can see from there, we have uh, the note names already placed here. We still had uh, images for the, um, for the scores, but we were showing the progress of the, of the player. So with this red dot, we were uh, showing the progress. But it was very time consuming because we had to manually map each note to the place in the score. So it was, I mean, but for the purposes of showing the technology and where, where we were going to, um, this was okay at, the, at that point. And we also had like better uh, fingerings for the different instruments. These were also hard coded. So we knew that to play the trumpet, to play this F sharp, we needed to do that. So we also hard coded all the fingerings. Uh, the idea was to slowly develop them to be all auto automatic, but at this stage in 2011, it was still in, in this stage. So again, uh, 
you will see a little bit the difference here for applied research institutions. At this point, Frank Hofer was already showing uh, songs to see in Sibit, Didacta, and Musik Messe, which are trade shows, right? So it's a little bit the difference that, it's, I mean, we were also presenting this work in, in scientific conferences, but there's already this attempt to engage the users to show people what we're developing, get feedback from them, because we would go to these show, uh, trade shows, and I don't know, hundreds of people would play with songs to see, and then, of course, everyone has a different idea, different uh, feedback. So this is a little bit the difference between the two uh, worlds. In March 2012, then we already had a fully functioning scrolling score, piano roll. Uh, we already had automatic fingering animation, so we were not longer hard coding anything. There was also score rendering. As you can see, there was already polyphonic uh, pitch detection. At the beginning, it was only monophonic, but at, the, uh, at this uh, point, we already had polyphonic pitch detection. And again, the attempt to go to presenting different trade shows and also scientific conferences, of course. So this was already quite one of the final versions of Songs to See. Um, June 2013, which was more or less the end of the project. So we had incorporated many different instruments. We were doing um, automatic analysis so of the performance. Uh, so red means that you really miss, miss the note. Green is okay. Uh, yellow is more or less. We had time stretching and pitch shifting, transposing. So we kind of had a fully functioning app that kind of fulfilled all, all the requirements of what he, we had envisioned at the beginning of the project. So again, here I'm going to show you a quick video because it's just easier to explain it with a video of what songs to see looked like in 2013. And you can find all this information online if you are interested. <laughs> So this is how more or less Songs to See looks today. So Songs to See in 2013 became commercially available. So um, and in, since 2013 to today, certain features have been updated, certain instruments have been modified. So we try to keep it alive by updating it as, uh, as much as we can. There's also a, a, an application that allows you to create content for the game. So basically you're not restricted to what the game brings, the songs that the, bring, the game has included, but you can create your own content. And there's a Steam shop, so for uh, those of you who like video games, it's on Steam. There's a digital shop as well in songs2c.com. But this is basically how the final end of the uh, 
applied research process uh, ended up uh, with the commercial um, release of some species. And just to finalize my talk, I just want to bring back these uh, cooperation models from Fraunhofer and the way Songs to See managed to go commercially available was through a spin-off, where basically some of the Fraunhofer employees that were involved in the development of the research that goes, went behind Songs to See, decided, we decided to become independent, create a small company, and uh, commercially uh, bring commer uh, Songs to See to the market. Um, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Yes. Like transcription for music videos. Yes. Yes. Uh, given the rather complex funding situation of some to see, is it was it possible to pursue some of the decision making at COP2 or did it have to reinvent? No. So there are many different ways in which. So Fraunhofer licenses technologies, right? So Fraunhofer doesn't sell products, but Fraunhofer licenses technologies. So when we decided to create a company, to market songs to see, we had to license the technology from Fraunhofer. But there are many licensing schemes that you can um, reach or agreements that you can reach. One of them is exclusivity, right? So you can ask Fraunhofer, I want this technology, but I want this technology exclusively for my product. But what comes with that is that you have to pay for that, right? Because that means that Fraunhofer cannot profit from this license with any other company. So what we did here was a non-exclusive license from Fraunhofer, which means that they are completely free to license it to any other company that might need it. So. Any other questions? Or we have internships, so you could potentially spend some time at Fraunhofer and work on the projects there. We don't, I mean, unless there's a project like this one, we don't normally run summer schools, but very often we, we, we do have exchange with universities, other research institutions for people to come to us and get involved a little bit in the industry projects or only on the research topics that we're developing in Fraunhofer. If you're interested, you're welcome to send me an email and we can really talk about that. Anything else? Thank you very much.